Back in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said this statement. Don't give to dogs what is sacred. Now, the dogs he was probably talking about are less a kind of, oh, you know, we Coco. It's probably not, oh, it's probably more like you. It's probably the kind of like skanky, stingy, kind of smelly dogs that he's thinking of. And he's saying, don't give to dogs what is sacred. These dirty, diseased dogs. They don't deserve anything sacred. Now, the principle behind that is, what something is determines what something should get. Let me say that again. What something is determines what something gets. So if me and Sarah were treating Sanka with more dignity than our boys, you'd report us to the social, wouldn't you? If Sanka was getting the kind of bed upstairs and food from Waitrose and all the best stuff and Keenan and Ruben were sleeping outside getting the scraps of whatever he left over, which is nothing, what would you say about us? You can be honest. (laughs) It's not right, is it? There's a right priority. There's a right order. Who someone is determines what someone gets. It's people over pets. Sanka after sons. That's the way around, isn't it? Who someone is determines what they get. Now, what is surprising about Matthew chapter 15, maybe even shocking, is that Jesus breaks his own rule. And Jesus takes what is sacred... And he gives it to dogs. Now I normally don't give sermons titles. I'm terrible at them. I think they often give away the punch of the sermon. But if I was given today's sermon a title, it would be, The Gospel is for Dogs. And Jesus is saying here that what he gives, he is going to give even to dogs. That's the scandal. And my guess is, as you read this, you are going to find this quite hard to stomach. All right? For more reasons than that. But before we get kind of into pressing play on this episode, I want to um, ask you some questions to press into your kind of thinking and feeling a little bit. And my, they're deliberately personal, and they are quite maybe emotive. But how much you're willing to kind of honestly engage with these two questions might determine how much you get out of today's service, okay? Here's question number one. What is the most hurtful thing that somebody could call you? I'm not going to ask you to shout that out. But what would it be? Maybe someone says you're up yourself. Uh, You're middle class. Maybe someone calls you a junkie. Maybe that you're paranoid. Maybe that you're angry. Maybe that you're self-righteous. Maybe someone just says, you are weak. And the truth is, if we're being honest, the things that hurt the most are the things that are tightest to the truth. So, if someone says to you, you're angry. I'm not angry! Oh, well, that reveals... Or... Sorry, good morning. (laughs) Um, Or, you're paranoid. I'm not paranoid. But the ones that are tightest to the truth are the ones that often hurt the most. Second question. Who are the people that you find it hardest not to be prejudiced against? Now, there's a massive amount of prejudice in our community. It's not hard to see it. But there's probably decent dollops of it in our own hearts that we find harder to admit. Who are the people that, if anyone else did it, you would probably say, oh, don't worry about it. But when they do it, just because of who they are, you come down on them like a ton of bricks. In our community, there's 
There's prejudice, you know, there's family loyalties that cause it, there's kind of territorial boundaries that can cause it. There, in our street, there's a kind of um, outsiders, insiders, there can be a working class, middle class. There can be that snobbery of acceptable drug users who have prejudice against junkies. You can have indigenous people against the foreigners who are coming in. You can have a Catholic Protestant thing. Um, for those of us who are now at home here, maybe back home, um, China and Hong Kong, there might be prejudice that goes that way. Certainly uh, Russia, Ukraine, certainly Israel, Gaza. There's going to be stuff that we are biased towards the people who are like us and, if we're honest, sometimes bigoted against the people who aren't like us. And our hearts have wounds that have become calloused towards people who have wounded us. Who are the people that you find you are discriminating against, maybe even racist towards. Now those two questions are getting to how other people view us and how we view other people. And we need to take those two claims and those personal answers with us into Matthew chapter 15. Okay? So let's start reading at chapter 15 verse 21. And we're just going to read our way through, okay? Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him. Now pause there. Um, we've seen Jesus withdraw a couple of times recently in Matthew's Gospel. Can you remember that stuff? So one time there was an episode of persecution that meant he withdrew for his own safety. Then there was an episode of popularity where he kind of withdraws for solitude. Now, the same thing happens. He withdraws again. But this time, it's not persecution and it's not popularity. The episode that provokes this has been the one of purity. Do you remember last week we saw this from the guy who never washes his hands after he's been to the toilet? Remember that? The issue's been purity. And so you might be expecting, okay, in persecution he sought safety in popularity he sought solitude so maybe in this moment of purity he's going to withdraw to someone or somewhere that's um, maybe sterile actually he does the complete opposite uh, Matthew wants you to see this it doesn't come across well in the NIV they don't translate it for some reason but see at the start of verse 22 there ought to be the word, behold. You remember we've seen that a couple of times in Matthew's Gospel already. When he wants you to notice something, he slaps down that word behold, and it is as if, I'm going to be loud again just to give you the kind of preparation this time. He's going, oh, come on, behold, I want you to see this. And so he's saying, behold, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity. He is asking his readers to Behold this woman. He's asking them, how do you view this woman? Now, his readers were largely Jews. And for a Jew reading this, Tyre and Sidon were dirty places. And for a Jew, a Canaanite was their most despised enemy. If it's a pantomime, this woman walks on the scene. And everyone says, boo. Because this is a dirty place and a despised enemy. And Matthew said, behold, Jesus has come to enemy territory. And behold, an enemy has come to Jesus. Right, let's keep reading. Verse 22. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Now you can see her need, but see the words that come out of her mouth. Lord, son of David. They are actually mental words for someone from a dirty place and a despised enemy to say. If you look back to Matthew chapter 1, the first thing that Matthew says in his gospel, the first words are, um, the story of Jesus, um, the Messiah, the son of David. That's the headline. He wants you to know the son of David. That's what all this gospel is about. But actually, all the way through this gospel so far, 
Not many people have got to that point. The closest people have got is in chapter 12, where some Jews are starting to realize it, and they're just asking the question, could this be the son of David? So Matthew stated at the start, there's some Jews who are kind of sensing it, but the first person to be sure of it is from a dirty place and is a despised enemy. That's a shock. But she's sure that David's son is the answer to her daughter's demonic suffering. And so she comes crying for mercy. Now, from what you know of Jesus, what would you expect him to do? Heal her, right? Heal the daughter. Okay, have a look at verse 23. Jesus did not answer a word. Huh. A sometimes silence is worse than someone saying something. We can translate silence to mean a million more terrible things. It's the blue tick on WhatsApp, isn't it? Like the, the message goes blue, but they don't reply. That's agony. And you're looking at it going, Jesus, what are you doing? Up to now, in the gospel, you've been so compassionate. Now you seem to be so cold. Doesn't say a word. Keep reading, verse 23. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after her. Now, they don't really care. They're just fed up with this woman. It seems that they've had their their kind of silence and solitude smashed a couple of times already. Now they're just saying to Jesus, listen, Jesus, please just do what she wants so that she does one. The disciples seem to kind of be impatient with her. But Jesus is still very impersonal towards her. He hasn't answered her question. Now he just answers the disciples. Look what he says, verse 24. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now he was cold, but now he seems to just have frozen over. I think you read this and you go, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this version of Jesus <clears throat> pretty rude quite impersonal he doesn't even do what his disciples have suggested by healing her just to get rid of her but he says listen my mission is tight and I know my lane the son of David has come for David's people not David's enemies and he's saying to this woman without speaking to her I may be in your region but you're not in my remit. I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. Now this woman, not to be deterred, probably because her daughter's suffering is so bad that it makes her stubborn. And in verse 25, the woman came closer now and she kneels before him and she says, Lord, help me. What do you think her tone is there? It's getting more desperate, isn't it? And you think, shh. Surely now Jesus is going, to, is going to do something. She's here, she's humble, now he'll heal. Mm, it gets worse. Look at verse 26. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs, and you are going. Wow, Jesus. Like, just stop digging. You can call this woman a dog. You see how desperate she is. You see how distressed she is by her daughter's suffering. But Jesus is saying, who she is determines what she gets. She's from a dirty place. She's a despised enemy. She is a dog. It's not easy reading, is it? And Jesus is saying there's a right priority. There's a right order. Children over dogs. God's people over God's enemies. And he seems to be saying it wouldn't be right for God's children to starve whilst God's enemies are satisfied. Now, Jesus has said this to his disciples already. Back in chapter 10, he sent them out on a mission and he said, chapter 10, verse 6, don't go among the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. 
That's our mission. They're our priority. And at one level you're going, okay, that sounds kind of right, but it feels kind of wrong. Maybe it is a little bit like the Israeli army paramedic who's operating in the Gaza Strip for wounded Israeli soldiers and he comes across an injured Palestinian civilian. And in that moment, the paramedic knows my time is limited, my supplies are limited, and the need is unlimited. And the reason my time needs to go to my people, my resources need to go to our wounded. And that way you can kind of go, but they're bleeding out. But they're suffering terribly. Jesus is going, I'm one man, I've got my mission, and my children come before dogs. How are you finding this? It's quite hard, isn't it? Right, we're finding it hard to hear, but hear how she hears it. Look at verse 27. He said, well, I can't take what's gone from the children to take it to the dogs. She says, yes it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Now notice something very interesting about her words. Does she deny the fact that she's a dog? No. She's not disputing that at all. She's owning it. She's admitting it. I am a dog. I am from a dirty place. I am a despised enemy. That is who I am. She's not just denying she's an enemy, but she's simply deeming that Jesus has enough. She's not contesting his priority. She's simply contending he's got plenty. It's as if she's kind of reasoning with Jesus. Listen to me. I might not be in your family tree, but I'll simply take what falls from your table. I wonder, I don't know, But I wonder if she'd heard the story of the feeding of the 15,000, as you called it a couple of weeks ago. And I wonder if she'd heard how many basketfuls had been left over. And so she's coming to Jesus saying, listen, I've seen what falls from your table. 12 basketfuls. And I know I'm not in your family tree, but... The leftovers are lavish, and that's enough for me. I am a dog, but I need those crumbs. And listen to Jesus' now response, verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, no longer a dog, interesting. Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment I don't think that makes things easier because then you've got to conclude has this woman just beaten Jesus in an argument has this woman backed Jesus into a corner has she like got his arm up her back and she sorry his arm has she got his arm up his back and has she got Jesus to do something that he didn't want to do because that's still not very good Now, I'm going to try and show you. I don't think that's what's happening. I think the way in which Jesus has interacted with her, although it appears pretty mean, he's been interacting with her in this way to both measure her faith and to magnify his mercy. Now, remember what he said, or what we've been saying. Who someone is determines what someone gets. Everything Jesus has said about this woman is true and everything Jesus has said about his mission is true there's nothing he says about her that isn't true like you like me this woman is defiled Do you remember what we saw last week out of the heart come evil thoughts if you look back to chapter 10 uh, sorry 15 verses 19 to 20 what comes out of us murder adultery sexual morality, theft, false testimony, slander. 
There is nothing about me that deserves Jesus' healing or Jesus' saving. Nothing. She was everything that Jesus says she was. I am everything that Jesus says I am. Now that hurts. But that's true. I am dirty. I am a dog. I am an enemy. When I cry out to Jesus, I deserve him to give me the silent treatment. When I cry out to him for mercy, I deserve Jesus to say to me, I did not come for you. When I kneel at his feet, I have no right to expect a single thing from him. Who I am determines what I should get. And the answer that comes back is nothing. Not even the scraps. I need to own that. I need to admit that. I need to confess that. Like the woman and say, Jesus, you're right. I am a dog. But isn't it interesting, it's when she says that, that Jesus says, you have great faith. Jesus says that the greatness of faith is that it doesn't make its plea based on me, but it makes its plea based on his mercy. Jesus says that the greatness of faith is measured by how unworthy it knows it is. Jesus says that the greatness of faith is the faith that admits they're a dog but pleads for the scraps anyway. The woman didn't get healed through Jesus making a mistake. Everything Jesus does in this dialogue is deliberately done to magnify his mercy. Why did he come to her region? So that she could come to him with this request. Why does he stay silent? He stays silent to intensify the division so that he can dramatize this moment of inclusion. Why does he make thing, a big thing about the gap between them? So that he can make an even bigger thing about him bridging that gap. Why does he underline what she deserves? So that he can highlight how much he gives her what she doesn't deserve. Do you see the point? He allows the drama to build in the story so that he can tell an even better story. His mercy is massive. And the crumbs of his mercy fall from his table, even to dogs. Even to dogs. See, Jesus is right. His priority was the people of Israel. But in Matthew's Gospel, there's always been crumbs that have fallen to people not from God's people. If you were to read Matthew 1 again, right, you get that family tree of Jesus. And most of the people in the family tree are Jews. But at points, crumbs fall to people who are not. Tamar. Ruth, Rahab. Most of the miracles Jesus does in Matthew's Gospel are for Jewish people in Jewish areas. But at times, the crumbs fall to people who are not. Like the centurion in chapter 8. Jesus sends his disciples out and he gives them a command, go to the lost sheep of Israel. But in chapter 10, verse 18, he does say, that eventually the crumbs will fall even to Gentiles. And in Matthew 28, Jesus will say, all authority has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations. The crumbs will fall even to dogs. See, the woman hasn't got something from Jesus by backing him into a corner. Jesus came to her region to deliberately drop crumbs at her feet. To demonstrate that despite who we are, Jesus gives us what we don't deserve. 
you could write over the cross the gospel is for dogs it's interesting that Jesus says it's not right for me to take what's for kids and throw it to dogs but I think if we're honest the thing that we ought to say is not right is it's not right for the son of God to give his life for dogs don't take what is sacred and toss it to the dogs and yet God the son gave his life for dogs he breaks his own rule to magnify the massiveness of his mercy we get crumbs but the crumbs of God's mercy is the cross of the Messiah even the leftovers are lavish I might be a dog I'll just take the crumbs and the I think what this is telling us is we, we have such a distorted view of what it means to approach God. We have such a distorted view of what it means to like come to a place like this. And our culture would tell us, come to God with your excuses. Or pardon my sin because this, that and this. Or we come to God as a victim and say, God, I, I, all this is in my past. I just, I just need you to to overlook everything else. Or we come to God with a mask and we try and say, Look, God, I've tried to get my life together and God has sent us the whole time. All you need to do is be honest about who you truly are. And he says, admit who you truly are and plead my mercy anyway. Because he gives his life even for dogs. Now, what happens next in the Gospel of Matthew, having seen that the Gospel's for dogs, begins to feel a little bit like deja vu. Okay? I'm going to read it to us. And if you've been tracking us through Matthew, you're going to go, have we not heard that before? So have a look at the first bit, verse 29. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. He healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speak, and the crippled made well, the lame walk, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. That sounds familiar. See, if you look back in your Bible, so chapter 14, verse 34, 35, and 36. It's almost a perfect retweet. What happened there happens again. Do you know what the only difference is? What happens back in chapter 14 was to Jewish people in Jewish territory. What happens here in chapter 15 is to non-Jewish people in non-Jewish territory. So in chapter 14, he is doing it for the lost sheep of Israel. In chapter 15, he is doing it for dirty dogs now read on the next bit chapter 15 verse uh, 32 and again see if it sounds familiar Jesus called his disciples to him and said I have compassion for these people they've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat I don't want them to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way his disciple answered where can we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd how many loaves do you have Jesus asked starting to sound familiar Seven, they replied. And a few small fish. Sound familiar? He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish. And when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of pieces, the number of those who ate was 4,000 men besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into his boat and went to visit the vicinity and went to the vicinity of Magadan. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Why? Because it's almost a perfect repeat of what we saw in chapter 14. Do you know what the only, well, there's a few differences, but do you know what the major difference is? 
In chapter 14, he's doing it for Jewish people in a Jewish territory. Where do you think he's doing it in chapter 15? To non-Jewish people in a non-Jewish territory. Before, in the first one, he is feeding lost sheep. In chapter 15, he is feeding dirty dogs. You see the repetition? Now, I think Matthew's doing it deliberately. He's putting the feeding and the healing and the healing and the feeding either side of what we saw last week about our defiled hearts. That's the kind of dirty sandwich. So, he feeds lost sheep, uh, Jewish people. He heals lost sheep, Jewish people. Defiled, dirty hearts. Then he heals uh, the non-Jewish people, the dirty dogs. And then he feeds the non-Jewish people, the dirty dogs. And the meat in the sandwich is what? Our dirty, defiled hearts. What's he saying? These two groups look very different. But their hearts are exactly the same. These two groups look different. But Jesus feeds and heals them both. These two groups look very different. But both groups are equally dependent upon Jesus' mercy. Now Matthew's writing this mainly to Jewish people. A people who from the top down had a lot of prejudice against people they would have considered to be dogs. And so Matthew is saying something hugely important to his mainly Jewish readers. He's saying, do you see what's going on here? There is an equality here. You're all unclean here. You're all defiled here. It's as if he's saying, do you know what? There's not much difference between a lost sheep and a dirty dog. Both are in need. Both equally need Jesus. And what I'm showing you is, Jesus does exactly the same thing for them as he does for them. It's not based on where they came from. It's not based on who they are. It is based entirely on his mercy. He's talked about the master's table. There is one entrance to the master's table. But at his table are all different kinds of people. There is one entrance to the master's table. But the master's table is multicultural, multicolored, multilingual. The truth is that if the gospel is for dogs, then there is no place for discrimination. And that was an important point for Matthew's readers back then. I think it's an important point for us today. We are so prone to view people from a human point of view. And when we see difference, we have prejudice. By putting the thing about the heart in the middle, Matthew is saying, despite differences... We're actually all the same. We're actually all desperately dirty and desperately needy. And we all need Jesus. And it is a a pretty stern word to us, I think, as those of us who, that second question, who are the people that we are most naturally prone to be prejudiced against? It's sent us. When you've put your faith in Jesus... You need to get your prejudice in the bin. It flows so naturally from our hearts, but it has no place in church. It has no place in a body of Christians because it has nothing, nothing to do with who Jesus is and how he has come and who he came for. And we need to plead with him if Regard, if we are Jews who were lost sheep who are now seated at his table, or if we were Gentiles who were dirty dogs who are now sat at his table, we need to plead with him that he would transform hearts from being prejudiced against people 
to have compassion for people like Jesus did. And pray that as he has given mercy to us, crumbs would fall from our table to the people who are least like us, that they might have a seat at the table with us.